Okay, so good morning to all of you. So I'm the last one. So I want to thank you to be here, and, and it's really a pleasure to, to talk to you. I'm usually giving talks to people with background in biology, but I like a lot to work with people with a more oceanographical point of view. So when Ananda asked me to give the talk here, I thought, what can I tell these people? And, and then I thought, how, if, if I'm the person that goes to the manager and says what to do with the uh, fisheries resources, and I have the possibility to talk to oceanographers, would, what would I ask them to do to me so I can do better advice to the managers to improve uh, the management of fisheries? So that's how I focus the talk here. So some is uh, my own experience, some is for others, and some is uh, to do in the future. So I'm working in, here in Baleares, so I'm working in the Spanish Institute of Oceanography, and we are the governmental research organization that gives advice to, to the fisheries managers about fishery in, uh, fisheries resources. We are some centers, and uh, in this uh, chapter here, or this talk, I'm uh, using some of the examples from partners I'm working with. So some of the people from my own institute, um, we are doing work with SOTHIP and then also with the Mediterranean Institute of Oceanography. So I think first I will talk to you a bit on, on marine living resources and which are the strategies we are using now to, to ensure the sustainable exploitation. And then I will say which I think they are the challenges in the rating of relational oceanography and the management of resources. And I will put some examples. There are more. And it's an open field, so I think we should really go together on this. So just if, if you are more interested, I could give you more examples privately. So really, the, the sea is full of life. And, and we have a wide variety of creatures, so we have bacteria and we have whales. And it sounds very, it's like, okay, of course, but sometimes to the biologist you need to say the sea is moving, like, you know, the water is moving, so you cannot have the fish and forget about the sea. But sometimes you have to take the physics that there is life. <laughs> so I think this is the first thing. There is life and there is movement and everything is together. So the survival of fish or the survival of any organism in the, in the sea depends on the environment and on the other biotic components. So let's think about the fish. If, if I'm a biologist, I will say, okay, a fish needs to eat, so I will study the fish and the copepods, for example, and I will forget about anything else. But every time the fish has a light gradient, for example, in a water column. So by choosing being up in the column, you have more light, you see better the food. If you go down, you are more safe, you have less opportunity to see the food, but you have less opportunity that the predators are eating you. But at the same time, you have a gradient of temperature. So you might be up, being more risky for the predators, but you grow better. So all the time, every organism in the sea is doing these decisions and trade-offs. Should I go up to the warmer water layer? Should I stay in the colder water layer? Should I go to the light? Should I not? So environment and, and, and biotic organisms is all together. So I think really we need to take care of, of all of it. So one thing interesting about the sea is that we are taking food from the sea. So it's a source of food and we have been doing this for like 2,000 years or more. And now we are really in a point where we need to develop sustainable strategies so, so we can ensure that we will have this food in the future. I, I mean. And this is not a joke. So this is a map of uh, the intensity of fishing activity in the world. The white points is where there is uh, some boat doing some fishing. And you can see most of the marine environments are being exploited now. So we really have an issue here at the local, at the national, and at the international scale. 
So just a bit to, to give you an overview of the type of fisheries, you know, we have recreational fishery, I will not come into that, but if we, took, if we talk about commercial fisheries, you will think in three main types. You have the coastal fisheries, so the pelagic fisheries, and the demersal fisheries. And they are acting in different places, no? In the sea. So if we go to the coastal fisheries, where well, we are close to the coast, not usually it's artisanal fisheries, and we are targeting a wide variety of species, so high diversity. If we go to the demersal fisheries, we are targeting fish that are on the floor, and uh, usually they are connected to the seabed or to the shelf or to the slope. Trawlers are fishing this, or, or you, we can use also the Mersal long line. And then we have the pelagic fisheries. So these are the ones going for the resources in the water column. The typical small fish, sardine, anchovy. We can also be fishing tuna, will be with the pelagic long line. So coastal, pelagic, demersal, separated. But the truth is that all these fish, coastal, pelagic, and demersal, they all hatch or are born from an egg that is one millimeter long. That is becoming a larva. And this is all happening in the water column. So it doesn't matter if you are a pelagic, a coastal, or a demersal, your egg and your larva will be in the water column. So really, the pelagic environment or the water column is the place where every, every early life stage of any fish meets. And what is happening there is going to influence all the resources. This is, for example, a life cycle of a pelagic species, which will be bluefin tuna. So bluefin tuna is, can be 300, 400 kilos but it's hatching from an egg, which is one millimeter, which is at the surface. So bluefin tuna is coming during the night, laying the egg on the surface, and in one month, it develops to a larva, and this is all happening in the first 20 meters of the egg. And then it will grow to an adult, and it, all its life cycle will be in the water column. It can be go down, going down to 1,000 meters, but never to the coast, never to the, the Mersau. But then you have this example, which is a, a demersal decapod, and you see also it has the same life cycle, and this goes to the water column. And for example, in decapods, you can have a larva that lasts for six months, seven months. So you are, you are really moving a lot, like a particle in, in the middle of the ocean. So I'm really interested in these early life stages, and I think this can do something for fisheries. Because if you see most fish, all the mortality or the highest mortality in the life cycle of a fish will happen only in this first month of life or two months. So here, just to give you a feeling, this is days. So you see, this goes very fast. For example, in a tuna, a, an egg will last for a day. And in one month, you will have this and, and you will have See, I mean, you will have half of your population will die just in one week or two weeks. So what is happening here is very important. And this is a mix of ecological, but also on physical processes. So I think environment and ecology, well, it's crucial for the evaluation and planning of management measurements to ensure the sustainable exploitation of all coastal, open sea, and demersal fish resources, because all will pass through these egg and larval stages. So how are we doing the management of fisheries most of the time? So this is a typical curve a manager will use to decide how to handle the, the fishery resources. So you will have here fishing effort, that's the, for example, the number of boats that can go to fish a resource. And then you will have there the average catch. So what you want is, well, this should be in zero. So if you have no boat going to fish, you have no catch. You begin to increase the number of boats that go fishing and your catch is increasing. And at some point, you have so many, so many boats that you follow fishing and your catch dimin diminish because you are 
you are killing too many, so your population is not able to, to cope with this cut. So you always want to be here. The best fishing effort to get the best cut. And this is what the manager wants. So maximum sustainable yield. <coughs> this has no environment. So what I do with this is I take data from catches, data from fishing effort, and I all the time try to see if I'm in this part of the curve or if I am in this part of the curve. So just for an example, I see bluefin tuna is beginning to decrease. Suddenly everybody is saying we have to keep bluefin tuna in a limit. So we go to the curve before and then we say, okay, we have to diminish either the catch or either the effort. So we say, okay, let's diminish the catch. So this is different boats taking bluefin tuna with a higher catch. I make a law that we have to decrease the total catch that we get and then we decrease. So you play with the catch or you play with the effort. But we have to remember that the environmental influence was doing, this has nothing to do with the fishery mortality, this has to do with natural mortality. So for example, if we take this process and we model it with the effect of temperature on the survival, because higher temperature is best, lower temperature is worse, I have natural viability in the abundance of my resource. But this is not being taken into account now when we do the fisheries manager, management. We also have changes because of global warming, as, as Laura was showing. So if you see here this plot, which is a generalization, but I think it gives an idea. These are predictions for 2050 with different scenarios of emissions. You have here different groups, phytoplankton, amphibians, birds, crustacea, fish, insects, mammals, and plants. So, for example, if you see to the, the timing of migration, when migration is happening, zero will be that in 2050 is like, like the average we see now. Up is that it's, it will happen later, and here is that it will happen earlier. And you see, in most organisms, we expect that, for example, migration is going to happen earlier. So fish are going to come to places earlier. So there's going to be a change in the future, just, for example, looking at warming temperatures. And then we also have another environmental influence, to put an example. And this is an example with Katsubonus pelamis. This species, which we are usually eating in cans when we, use, when we eat tuna, if you see the blue parts, this is the distribution of Katsubonus, and the red ones is where the larvae are. So you see it's a tropical species all over the world and was not in the med. But now it's coming into the med because temperatures are warming and this fish is coming here. So it's a new resources, it's a new um, individual in a place where it was never before. So all these things we have to take into account when we go into fisheries manager. So I think it's really a priority to link our knowledge on physical and biological oceanography and the needs for fisheries assessment. So what I'm going to show now is some of the examples of on how we are doing that. So I would put one example on, on tuna because, uh, well, I'm, I'm doing a lot of work with tuna and this work we are doing a lot with SOTHIP, so we are combining uh, oceanography from the pelagic environment and bluefin tuna knowledge or tuna knowledge from, from our knowledge on, as biologists. So this is the Balearic Islands. So we have three species. I'm not going to come into the new ones that are coming here, like the Katsubonus, only the ones that they are established. Bullet tuna, which is a, a fish that can get three, four kilos. This is a Mediterranean resident and is a reproducing coastally. We have albacore tuna, which gets 20, 30 kilos. It's also supposed to be a Mediterranean resident, and it seems that it's coming from here to Mallorca to reproduce in the summer. And then we have fluffin tuna, which can get up to 500 kilos. That comes from the Atlantic, so this fish is in the middle of the Atlantic, sometimes it's even in the coast of North America, and it's traveling 
just to come here in May, reproduce for one or two months, and then leaving. So you have a large migrator, a migrator that is in the Mediterranean, and a supposed to be fish that is not moving so much. So I say, OK, uh, how can we know where they are? I mean, they are coming to, to the Balearic Islands, but where are they reproducing? So here what we do is, uh, in here we use data from uh, CTDs. So this is the typical oceanographical data. You go to a cruise, you take your data, and then you also fish the larvae of the different tuna, you identify them, and then you do maps. And you can produce this type of maps. And in our case, in this area, there is a strong salinity front. So you have low salinity in blue here, which will be water that is coming from the Atlantic, which is merging to water that is resident. So what we see when we compare our CTD data when, with our larval data is that bluefin tuna will change the locations for reproduction depending on the situation of the front. So if I have a low salinity water going northwards, these that are my larva will be more in here. But if I have a situation where the salinity front is more southwards, the larva will be southwards, meaning that the adults were either here or here. But if I go to Albacore, I see that it doesn't matter where this salinity front is, I always have the reproduction in here. So it's independent from the front. And then I have bullet tuna, which is always in the coastal areas. So if I want to predict where the reproductors of bluefin tuna are going to be, I need to consider the front. If I want to predict where albacore or bullet tuna are going to be, I don't need to know where the salinity front is. But if I want to see how these species overlap, I need to know where the front is. So what if oceanographers are able to produce products that tell me where the salinity fronts are going to be, I'm able to forecast the location. So I think this is a role in operational oceanography. Are you able to produce products? In this case, it's a gradient of salinity and gradient of geographical velocity, because then when I go to the oceanographers, the oceanographers tell me, well, forecasting salinity, that's, that's a big mess. So we work into having a better prediction of the location of the salinity front, that's the oceanographical side, but it has an effect on the, on the biological. So what do we do when we have these forecasting maps? What can we do with them? You can do many things. What we are doing now that is being applied in the assessment is that because we have a, to design a scientific sampling, but we go for bluefin tuna, but bluefin tuna is changing the position because of the front. I, if I get this before going to my cruise, I can plan how I'm going to sample well all the tuna because I'm going to know where the front is and I'm going to be able to change or adapt my location of stations to be sure that I'm representing well the habitat. And that's allowing me to get an index of larval abundance that I'm providing every year to the managers, and they are using to estimate the abundance of the bluefin tuna. It's another index. So every year I get these maps, I'm able to reorganize my sampling strategy, I'm able to produce a larval index. That's one of the use. I mean, we can have many more, but I mean, I can tell you <laughs> if you are interested afterwards. So that's one example of how I think Simple things like maps of salinity, maps of radiance of temperature can help to know where the fish are. This is another example. This is the med. So how managers make their assessment for the fisheries is that we kind of make these frontiers. This is for the med fish, this is hake. So these lines are fixed, have no reason. Sometimes the reason is political. So what I will do is, OK, I'm the manager in, let's say, number five, which is Balearic Islands. So I will take the data from the fishermen in the Balearic Islands. And I will do my rules for the Balearic Islands. And I will not care about six or seven. And seven will not care about five. So each 
each of these squares is an independent unit. So the fish there, they don't move from there. And then I go into this, and then I say, this is for the intermediate water layer. So I say, if in the deep waters, this is what is happening about days that a particle can be in the same place, what is not happening upper in the water layer, where it's supposed to be things moving more. So I say, well, and what about if management areas are connected and this is wrong? So I go back to here and I say, okay, I'm going to analyze 5, 6, and 7 because I have the data for 5, 6, and 7. And then I do this. I take circulation models. I take Hake, which again is living in the bottom, but it has larvae that they are in the pelagic surface. And then I say, I know where the hake is. Let's see where they, they come from. And I get something like this. It's not only that areas are connected, it's that they are not connected the same way all the time because it depends on the oceanography. So I can have an scenario like this where I have connection in here because of the currents with the larva. So the larva are transported and they arrive here when they are juveniles. So the juveniles that I'm catching here, they are really coming from here. And they are not connected with the Balearic Islands. But then I have this scenario where I have this transport, but then I have a connection with the Balearic Islands. So because I put oceanography, I have to say management areas are connected and besides, I have to be dynamic in how my management areas are connected because I don't have the same situation all the time. So operational oceanography can help to decide how to design the management areas. In this case, for Hake. But imagine you, we can do this exercise for different species. And, and, and this was only these three, but what about the whole Mediterranean? So I can do an exercise in general, to see which are sinking or source areas in the med. So if I have sinking areas or source areas, I will say this is an area that is giving a lot of larva to other places, or this is a place where a lot of larva are coming. So I can do this type of, of, of scenarios for each part in the med where I have sinking areas and source areas. I, I can try to see which is the oceanographical or, or, or geographical reason behind that. It's a retention area or a drifting area. Okay, one of the problems I have seen sometimes is like, if the drift model is done only by a physic, uh, sometimes we forget that the larva can change their position in the vertical. So these are simulations in the Norwegian Sea, and you have, I mean, this is, this is a passive particle. I mean, I will not come into the fact that you have to take care that the fish move, so it's not a passive particle, it's an active particle. But and if you do simulations at one meter depth or at 30 meters depth, your results are completely different. But then you have fish that move from one to 30 meters. So, if we don't put together the models and the, and the biologists see, because this at one meter or 10 meters will be reasonable, for example, for bluefin tuna, but Hake is at 60 meters. So you really need to take care of who you are dealing with and, and what's the life strategy of that species. Because I have seen many times bluefin tuna during 40 days. And I say, come on, when it's 40 days, there's no larva. It's a fish like this. So it has no sense to to model a particle that is passive for more than 30 days if there is no larva. Or we did the model in winter. <laughs> it's like, yeah, but in winter, they, there is no fish that is hatched in the surface. So it, it means nothing for, from a biological concept, but it means nothing from an oceanographical concept that I think everything is quiet in the same place. So I think this uh, we need. And, and another thing in this that I have seen like an error is that you know, the, the time that a larva is a larva or an egg is an egg, it depends on the water temperature and it also depends on the species. So everything has to be more flexible. It's like if I put a model of tuna and my water is increasing 10 degrees in two, day, in two weeks, I need to take care that the 
larvae that are being hatched later are growing much faster, but much faster, like, like in one it will take for me 15 days to become a juvenile and in the other 30 days. And, and this is really important and, and we are not taking care of this. So, so we are doing a lot of mistakes also in, in how we predict how particles move when we want to think about the fish. So this is coming from discussions with oceanographers and, and I really like when we have these discussions and, and we really work in detail in, into the currents are well, that's also happening, that the currents are the opposite or not. So, okay, the oceanographer says this model you can use and then we go into these details and then it gives nice results and, and I think it's, it's the realistic thing. And I will put the last example, which uh, has nothing to do with the, with the things that I have seen before, I have been telling before, but I will talk about the marine protected areas. This is just uh, something that I think is very interesting in the med, because we have all these marine protected areas. So I will put an example. This is Cabrera. It's a national park here in Spain. And what you do when you do a marine protected area is you take your, your place, this case Cabrera, and then you begin, begin again to make sonification. So you say, okay, in here you are not going to be able to fish. In here you are going to be able to fish, but only with these gears. In here you are going to be able to make a scuba diving, but so, so you make different things, like for example limitations on fishing gear, fishing effort, fishing sled. And this is mostly coastal, so you see this is very close to the coast. So how does the marine protected area work? It, it ha to improve fisheries, which is what we are talking here, it, it helps to improve a lot of things. But, uh, so there are two main mechanisms that the marine protected area works. One is through larval export. So you have your fish here, this is your protected area. And what you expect is that these fish are producing larvae, remember that all produce larvae, well, most of them, that will drift to a place where they will settle as juveniles and will become adults. So you are enhancing the area that is outside your MPA. So you are protecting this to improve this. You are also improving this because you are not fishing there, but you are going out of your MPA. Or you can have this other, this other way. You have your fish here in the marine protected area. And what you expect is that you are producing more fish here, your juveniles are coming here, and your fishing effort is very close to your protected area. But they are enhancing the, the fishery because the fish, because they are more here, they are very close, and they can be caught. So this is adult spillover. This is larval export. So in general, this is how an MPA works to improve fisheries. So how can we use operational oceanography to improve the success of uh, MPAs for fisheries? So if we took the adult spillover, remember you have areas that they are close, you can do something like, for example, in this case where, where they have shown is that the coastal exposure, so the waves, was the most important variable determining the biomass in the MPA. This is a study that was done in Cabrera. So if you have a boya like this, or some record of wind and of waves, you can be able to see which could be the biomass and the life stage that you will have in each part and the carrying capacity of that part. So you are able to find the variable, in this case, coastal exposure of waves, and you are able to have a routine measurement of that variable, so you can kind of have an idea how it's going to be the biomass. You have the other way, larval export. So imagine this is the MEV, and this is all the marine protected areas coastal that we have now. Well, this, this is not coastal, I, I will not come into this, but all this. So because you want to export, you need to have hydrodynamic models. But the problem I see with hydrodynamic models is that we are forgetting the interface between the coast and the pelagic. So I need a model that is good enough for the coast, but that is good enough also for the pelagic. So 
how do I work with this interface? Coastal pelagic, because the larvae are going to be pelagic. So we really need hydrodynamic and drifting models that couple the different spatiotemporal scales. And I think this is a challenge, and I think this is very interesting if we want to increase the effectivity of marine protected areas and the prediction of how it's going gonna, gonna to be. So, I mean, are we able to make a network of MPAs in the MED that work together? Th this is going to be, I think, one of the challenges for oce operational oceanography. And this is an example, which is the thing I think we would like to be in, but this is very difficult. This is the Australian. So the Australians are really evolved with this. So this is a, well, a spatial dynamic marine protected areas. So this is going from a point of view of static things to the point of view of dynamic things. So this is a nice example for tuna. So what they do is they predict the habitat that is going to be good for tuna, bad for tuna. And they set the management boundaries every time depending on the habitat. So you are able to say the fishermen have to be in here this year. The fishermen have to be in here this year. So you do a spatial managing, or you manage where the fish can go. The f sorry, the fishermen can go. And you try to equilibrate where the habitat is good or bad, and, and, and then you put some quota. I mean, this for now is a, an imagination in the med. But I think um, it would be nice if we do this with fishermen, and stakeholders, oceanographers, and biologists, and we begin to manage things dynamic because we are managing them statically, and, and we see that sometimes it's, it's not working. So I think just as a summary, well, I think if we want to ensure the long-term sustainability of marine resources, we really need to integrate ocean observing system, ecological model, and management policies. And I think really a broad collaboration will enlarge our global vision of sustainability of living marine resources. And I really think it's, it's the place we have to go. So I think the community is ready for this, so we just have to make it real. And that was it. Thank you.